Tonight, the children who died in a house fire in Northern Ontario are mourned by their community. We can fight this opioid crisis. We can fight the substance use. We just need to work together. Plus, the car cross Tagish First Nation in the Yukon takes steps to battle Canada's worst outbreak of overdose deaths. The First Nations had lower odds of receiving these higher acuity triage scores. And is the cure worse than the disease? A study shows unequal balance in how First Nation patients are treated in Alberta ERs. Good evening and welcome to APTN National News. I'm Daryl Stranger. We have more details from that tragic house fire in Sandy Lake First Nation. According to a statement released by the nation, only one water truck was available to feed the fire truck and the lack of adequate water lines and, in, and infrastructure prevented the use of fire hydrants. They also identified the three children who died. Grant Mikis turned nine years old on January 13th. His sister Remy Mikis was six and younger brother Grant Fiddler was four. They are survived by their parents Delaney Mikis and Cassandra Mikis as well as three other siblings. Sandy Lake First Nation is 600 kilometers north of Thunder Bay. Our deepest condolences go out to their family. Akaluit's water woes continue again this week as officials confirm there is fuel in the city's water system. Yes, again. Melissa Ridgen explains. According to the City of Iqaluit's website, the water system is currently being flushed and water samples being analyzed. Officials say, quote, trace amounts of fuel was confirmed in the water last week after residents took to social media complaining of a fuel smell coming from the taps. Iqaluit went 60 days without clean tap water beginning last October. The military was called in and residents lived on bottled water for those two months before the problem was fixed. That problem being a nearby fuel tank somehow leached into the water system. Residents only enjoyed less than a month of having taps back on before the problem came back last week. The city of Iqaluit says there are very low concentrations of fuel in the water now, not warranting a do not consume order, but they do understand residents' reluctance to want to drink it. Yesterday they posted on Facebook that they're looking for an alternative source of water right now. The government of Nunavut says experts are working to resolve the issue yet again. Melissa Ridgen, APTN National News, Winnipeg. Joining us now to discuss the situation is Iqaluit Mayor Kenny Bell. Mayor Bell, thanks for joining us today. Uh, what can you tell us about how your city is coping with uh, the new fuel smell? Yeah, well, uh, you know, uh, it's frustrating. Uh, you know, all everyone's frustrated and, and you know, frankly, really tired of um, the never-ending emergencies here. But um, you know, it's one, it's one. Okay, like you know, Monday, Monday morning, Wednesday morning, we had two hits uh, around fifty, between fifty and sixty micrograms um, on this SCAN unit, which tests hydrocarbons from our water. Um, uh, it does. It's too low. To hit our uh, alarm, so we didn't know about it until the complaints started coming in, and um, you know it's it's you know well within the Canadian limits. But why is there a Canadian limit for uh, for hydrocarbons in the water? Is uh, you know beyond me. But uh, it's just it's it's stressful and uh, and and tiresome. Now, as you just mentioned, the levels are below the threshold. But how safe is the water with even trace amounts of fuel present? Yeah, you know, I, you know, uh, I'm a layman in in, in water uh, thought process, you know. But um, you know, the government of Canada has uh, 390 micrograms as a limit, and uh, you know, we were around between 50 and 60 um, that was uh, going out of our treatment center. So um, for those two those two mornings, anyways, um, you know, we haven't had any hits on the SCAN since then, so that's that's good news. Um, you know, it's just we 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 assume we. Uh, there's obviously work being done, but right now, um, you know, we we think that that was just an uh, anomaly that there was some leftover, um, you know, hybrid gardens in our in our system somewhere that that you know finally flushes its way through. So we're we're hoping that's the case. Uh, you know, we're obviously uh, testing and and you know there's an environmental cleaning that was supposed to come start today, but the, there's a flights were canceled from Ottawa. Um, so you know, hopefully they'll be starting tomorrow, and and we'll get all that done as well. So, Mayor Bell, what are your options for a, an alter, alternate source of water? 
Uh, you know, really, there's there there isn't really an alternative source right now. We we do have our uh, Silver Grinnell River, which is in our territorial park, and uh, we use it during the summer, and we are using it right now to help. Um, we have one one location open for river water, um, but because the government of Nunavut hasn't called the do not consume, uh, we're still just operating with our regular tap water. Um, I I've, I've personally never smelt the. Um, the diesel. Uh, one time um, here at City Hall, uh, early morning around 7 a.m., I smelt it when uh, for a very fast second when I started the um, coffee. But uh, I've never smelt it. Uh, over the last couple of days, I've gone to a couple of my friends' houses that I that have you know been complaining about the smell, and I still haven't smelt it. So it's just uh, it, it's at that level where um, it's it's not. It's not a lot, but uh, some people are more susceptible to the smell than others, and um, you know that's pretty pretty indicative we, we had 116 phone calls uh, as of yesterday at three o'clock um and um you know we have obviously way more than 116 residents so um the you know the the numbers i mean it's not good uh, don't get me wrong uh, is, uh, having this having anything in our system is terrible but um you know it, it it seems like it's it was just uh you know an isolated incident and hopefully uh, after our flushing our systems um it will be back to normal again now, your 8,000 residents have just come off a, a two-month-long do-not-consume order. What's your message right now to them? Oh, man, you know, uh, the frustration, uh, I know people are frustrated. Some people are more frustrated than others. Um, I'm frustrated. Uh, you know, I don't understand this stuff. Uh, you know, as 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 a mayor during this time, especially you know under COVID restrictions and 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 you know COVID world, uh, it's been a real hard time for all of us. And uh, you know, the fact that everyone's been home has been even worse. Um, you know, you, you should be able to expect clean water from your house, uh, from your taps. Um, you know, we're 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 going to get it fixed. Um, we're waiting for the government of Canada for to to announce. Hopefully, uh, obviously, we, we're we're looking for some good words from the government of Canada soon uh, on the 184 million that we've asked for to help fix our our uh, water supply uh, original crisis, which has been over six years now, uh, around six years now. Um, and it's, so, you know, it's just that water has been a major issue here for a number of years, and uh, we, we really need uh, some some federal support and uh, to get there. Um, we're working hard to get it fixed, and uh, you know, I, I, I'm I'm just very grateful for the patience of our citizens. All right, Mayor Bell, thank you so much for taking a few minutes to speak with us today. Of course, anytime. Thank you so much. Some good news on the pandemic front. Health Canada approved a new antiviral drug for, for those infected with COVID-19 on Monday. APTN's Fraser Needham has more. And today, Health Canada announced it has authorized Paxlovid, the first COVID-19 therapy that can be taken at home. Canada's chief public health officer says the new drug adds another weapon in the toolbox to fight COVID. It's a drug that can treat those experiencing mild COVID symptoms. And non-fully vaccinated Indigenous people are one of the priority groups keep high-risk Canadians out of the hospital or from even dying. Today's announcement is particularly important as access to easy-to-use treatments could help to reduce the severity of COVID-19 in adults who become newly infected uh, and are at high risk of progressing to serious illness. At the same time, the health minister says the drug should not be seen as a substitute for getting vaccinated. A drug is a treatment. You know, it's much better not to have to be treated and the best way to not to have to be treated is to be vaccinated. So you don't want to end up with COVID-19, even though you might be given a drug. No, that's not what you want. Leader Aaron O'Toole commented on the fact Paxlovid is in short supply. I understand there's really only about 30,000 uh, doses in Canada. We have to ramp that up dramatically get it to the provinces as quickly as possible and the provinces need to prioritize it in a way that takes pressure off of our hospital system. Other priority groups include those who are immunocompromised and people aged over 60 living in remote communities. Fraser Needham, APTN National News, Ottawa. A study by the University of Alberta and the First Nations Information Governance Centre shows unequal treatment in Alberta emergency rooms. As APTN's Chris Stewart reports, some people in high places are starting to notice. When someone gets hurt badly enough, they normally go to the nearest emergency room. A health worker will assess the damage and assign a triage score from 1 to 5. 5 being non-urgent, 1 being the most serious. 
the University of Alberta studied 11 million visits to Alberta emergency rooms between 2012 and 2017. The result, First Nations people are triaged at a less important level, meaning longer wait times or the patient just leaves before getting treatment. Dr. Patrick McLean of the University of Alberta in Edmonton led the study. For three of the five diagnoses we looked at, that's long bone fractures, acute upper respiratory infections, and anxiety disorder, we also saw that First Nations had lower odds of receiving these higher acuity triage scores. Broke your arm or leg? You are 18% less likely to have a higher triage score than a non-First Nation patient. 10% less likely for respiratory infections. And anxiety disorders, the number jumps to 33%. Overall, First Nations people have a 7% less likelihood of a higher priority triage. Leah Bill is the executive director of the First Nations Information Center, a registered nurse from Pelican Lake First Nation in Saskatchewan. She co-led the study, talking to people and elders, many who said they were not treated very well. There was many stories shared with regards to uh, racism, for example, uh, uh, derogatory things being said about them uh, by healthcare providers, and, and then them leaving and not getting the care that they needed. She says health providers need to stop stereotyping people. There is a presumption that uh, when Indigenous people or First Nations people present to the emergency that they're drug-seeking as opposed to coming with a serious uh, um, condition. Uh, my, my viewpoint on that is, is it doesn't matter whether or not you, you have uh, an addiction issue. Uh, the first and foremost thing when you present at the emergency department, uh, you should be assessed and triaged for a physical condition. Bill says that Alberta Health appears to be listening. We have provided them with recommendations. The good thing is that they are listening to us. And, and I believe that they are seriously looking at uh, ways and mechanisms to bring about change. Uh, they do support our research uh, completely. But what we'd ask of the providers is that they really strive to see the patient before them as a unique individual. And we hope that these study findings are going to drive that kind of positive change and help improve the healthcare system. Chris Stewart, APTA National News, Edmonton. We need to take a short break, but still to come, two First Nations in British Columbia are striving to improve systemic racism in off-reserve education. We'll tell you how next. Welcome back. Systemic racism is often problematic in off-reserve education, and it's no different in northern British Columbia, where two First Nations are striving to improve the education of their children in the Prince George School District. APTN's Lee Wilson reports on what is being done to reach that goal. For years, McLeod Lake Indian Band and Clayley Tanay First Nation have been raising concerns over education of Indigenous students in School District 57, located in Prince George, B.C. Last year, the Minister of Education sent special advisors to investigate their concerns. Last summer, advisors released a report that found systemic racism and made over 40 recommendations. On Friday, leadership from the two communities announced the formation of an Indigenous Education Leadership Table. It plans to work with the school district. So this new table is uh, hopefully going to raise awareness about Indigenous values, Indigenous protocols, um, Indigenous ways of knowing, and it'll give an opportunity for us to define a new relationship with the school district. The Minister of Education's Special Advisory Report said they found discriminatory practices in the Prince George School District. Unfortunately, we heard many examples of behaviors and practices that are clearly discriminatory and systemically racist. Though some will argue it is not intentional, the outcomes have disproportionate effects on Indigenous students and can only be explained as such. According to a press release, the Ministry of Education advisors are now working with the school district on recommendations 
The school board must also consult with local First Nations. AP10 News contacted the Prince George School Board for a comment, but did not hear back before airtime. School District 57 is made up of 30% Indigenous students, according to the school district website. McLeod Lake and Clayley Cheney hope they can work with the school board to improve graduation rates for Indigenous students and improve their overall education experience in the future. What the Indigenous Education Leadership Table has to offer for the school district with a more hands-on approach with uh, direct leadership because our nations have always played a role within the school district, but it was always in an advisory capacity, whereas this will be more of a leadership and hands-on to support our students. In March, the Ministry of Education Special Advisory will release a follow-up report from Prince George. Lee Wilson, AP10 National News, Kitimat. Residents of a small Yukon community came together this weekend to remember those lost to addictions. Now they're calling for change so no more lives will be lost to the territory's addictions crisis. Here's Sarah Connors with that story. Carcross, Yukon. It's a small rural community known for its breathtaking beauty, but the people who live here are in crisis. <laughs> During the first week of January, three members of the Carcross Takish First Nation died from drug-related deaths. On Saturday, dozens of people gathered in the community to remember them and others lost to addictions. Felicia Johnson helped organize the vigil. A resident of Carcross for nine years, she says the deaths weigh heavily on everyone. It's really sad to see so many young people losing their lives. And, you know, a lot of those people are Indigenous people. The vigil was part of a territory-wide series where several communities remembered their loved ones lost to addictions and other problems associated with poor mental health. Last year alone, the Yukon Coroner Service reported over 20 people died in the territory from opioid abuse. The service says the territory is now leading Canada in opioid deaths per population of 100,000 at 48.4 deaths. So I just want to extend our gratitude and um, our love and our prayers out to each community. Um, Lindsay Amato is from the Carcross Tagish First Nation. She says the Yukon government isn't providing enough supports for people struggling in rural communities. For example, the territory's only supervised consumption site is in Whitehorse. They need to give us more preventative services to each of our rural communities. They need to support our Indigenous people more than they ever have before. Johnson agrees. She says some people in the community don't have computer skills and can't access what little supports are already in place. Not a lot of people have support or, you know, someone to help them locate those resources or they don't have internet or, you know, they may be lacking the computer skills. The Carcross Tagish First Nation declared a state of emergency over the deaths last week. The First Nation aims to secure more funding and supports from the territorial and federal governments. John Stryker, the community's MLA, promised he would lend his support. I really appreciate uh, Carcross Tagish First Nation uh, stepping forward and I uh, want to show my support uh, uh, as the MLA and, and as the government. Johnson is hopeful the community can come together to fight its addictions crisis. We can fight this opioid crisis. We can fight the substance use. We just need to work together. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Carcross. We need to step aside for one final break, but still ahead, a new anti-bullying documentary that highlights cultural significance of braids is set to premiere this week in Calgary. Details next. Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. Jesse Jensen sent today's photo of the day. It's a view from along the frozen shoreline of Babeen Lake in northern British Columbia. Looks like a snow-covered dock there, very calm and peaceful looking. Be sure to submit your photos to share at aptn.ca for the chance to be featured as our next photo of the day. And now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast.
Beginning in the east, plus four in St. John's and zero degrees in snow in Fredericton. Minus four in snow in Nain and minus 21 in La Grand River. Minus 20 in a mix of sun cloud in Val d'Or and minus four in Quebec City. Minus 18 in a mix of sun and cloud in North Bay and minus 13 in Ottawa. Minus 18 in Timmins and minus 25 in Big Trail Lake. Minus 26 in Churchill and snow and minus 26 in Thompson. Snowing and minus 23 in Winnipeg and minus 21 in snow in Brandon. More snow in Saskatoon and minus 22 and minus 8 in snow in Yorkton. Minus 29 and a mix of sun and cloud in Stony Rapids and minus 12 in Buffalo Narrows. Over in the west, a mix of sun and cloud and minus 25 in Fort Chippewan and minus 25 in Peace River. Mix of sun and cloud and minus 17 in Edmonton and plus 12 in Calgary. Plus 7 in Campbell River and sun and minus 6 in Quinell. Minus 11 in Dees Lake and sunshine and minus 22 in Fort Nelson. Minus 19 in a mix of sun cloud in Beaver Creek and minus 15 in Rock River. Sunshine and minus 28 in Norman Wells and minus 26 in Wrigley. Minus 26 in Colville Lake and minus 32 in snow in Fort McPherson. Minus 27 in Cambridge Bay and clear in minus 29 in Chesterfield. Minus 29 in clear in Resolute and snow in minus 25 in Iqaluit. The Pacific nation of Tonga is under a tsunami warning after the eruption of an undersea volcano. Satellite images show the moment the volcano erupted Saturday, resulting in large waves crashing across the shorelines of the many islands making up the Polynesian nation. There were no immediate reports of injuries or the extent of damage, as communications with the small nation have remained problematic. Authorities in Fiji have also issued a warning to avoid the shoreline, and New Zealand's military said it was monitoring the situation. A new anti-bullying documentary that highlights cultural significance of braids is set to premiere this week in Calgary. Braves Wear Braids sheds light on the backlash a lot of youth face when it comes to wearing braids. The doc was produced by Jamie and Bryce Starlight after hearing from boys and men who were teased and bullied for their braids. It will stream online for free starting Thursday on the Braves Wear Braids website. Bryce says many schools plan to use it as a learning tool. He hopes it encourages Indigenous youth to grow their hair. Uh, a way to kind of physically show that support and physically give kids that encouragement that either are currently growing up their hair or have a desire to do so. That documentary. That's all the time we have for you tonight on APTN National News. As always, check out our website at aptnnews.ca for more Indigenous news. I'm Daryl Stranger. Thank you for joining us and have a great night.